Good morning. Today I want to say something in, about an important area of mortgagee practice, uh, and in particular the availability of an injunction against the mortgagee who wishes to enforce the mortgage. This is an area that comes up time and again on the equity division duty list where the duty judge is, is asked to uh, prevent the mortgagee sale. Usually, unfortunately, this sort of application is made at the very last minute, and we'll discuss that in due course. <clears throat> of course, the longer the delay, the less likelihood there is of getting any relief. All right, so we're looking at a situation where a mortgagee is relying on a fully matured power of sale. Uh, we'll assume a Section 57 2B notice in New South Wales has been served, time has run out. You then go up to court and seek to get some sort of injunctive relief. Can you do so? Well, in terms of getting injunctive relief, uh, you'll run into a number of difficulties, uh, and that's because there are basic rules which require a mortgagor who's seeking the relief from the court, in the usual case, to pay in uh, at least part of the mortgage amount, or offer to pay in. And we're looking here at two old cases which are still uh, important in terms of precedent. Harvey and McWatters, M-C-W-A-T-T-E-R-S, which is in 49 State Reports, New South Wales at 173, the decision of Sir Bernard Sugarman, and then in the High Court of Australia, Inglis and Commonwealth Trading Bank, which is at 126 CLR at 161. And the doctrine I'm now discussing is usually referred to as the, as the doctrine in Inglis's case. And those cases uh, state as a basic rule that if you come to court seeking relief uh, by way of injunction to prevent the mortgagee from selling, then you will need to actually offer to pay in. Now, a lot of people have uh, pointed out the incongruity of this, Justice Bryce and Justice Hamilton. We've got a number of different decisions which demonstrate or refer to the absurdity in a way, if you like, of, of having to have the money available to pay out the mortgage before you can get relief to stop the, the mortgagee from selling. Seems to be a bit of a paradox if one thinks about it. And you can see a discussion of that by Justice Hamilton in a case called Parist Holdings and Perpetual Nominees, 2006, NSWSC at 599. Um, well, position seems to be this, you're actually asking for the court to intervene by way of injunction, and so in order to get that sort of relief in the court's exclusive jurisdiction, you will need to offer to do equity, and in offering to do equity, you've either got to pay in all the amount or a substantial part of the amount, which is uh, owed under the mortgage. Um, it would seem if you've got uh, some sort of opportunity for refinancing and you can pay in part of the amount, then you might be in a position where you can uh, pay in that part and then get relief until the refinancing, refinancing comes through. But in a general sense, uh, you'll need to offer to pay in something. Now that position's got to be contrasted with a situation where there is no fully matured power of sale. And in that uh, situation, the court is really looking at the, the Court of Equity's auxiliary jurisdiction. The auxiliary jurisdiction is where the Court of Equity is acting in aid of some common law complaint. So take a simple example. It may be that you say that no money is owing under the mortgage contractually. Or it may be that you say the amount has been grossly overstated in the uh, 57 2B notice. Or it may be that you say the original contract of mortgage itself was, uh, was unconscionable uh, or un unenforceable for some reason. In all those cases, you're really attacking the basic contract. And in that sort of situation, so it would seem, there's no obligation to actually offer to pay in the full amount. So you've got two contrasting situations. If you turn up and simply say that there's going to be some sale and undervalue or some problem, in equity's exclusive jurisdiction, you need to offer to pay in all or part. If you're talking about the fully mature power of sale and say that it hasn't matured, then you won't need to pay in. So that means if you're looking to attack the basic mortgage itself, you might suggest, for example, that it uh, was induced by improper statements, that you might suggest that there's some sort of popular homes set off available because you've got some other claim against the mortgagee. Those are the sort of cases where it may be that you will not need to pay in. Now, with respect to, to mortgages generally, an important point that a lot of borrowers don't understand and don't seem to appreciate is that there's no obligation on the part of the uh, mortgagee to sell at any particular time. The mortgagee can simply sit there, uh, whether it's a mortgage or a guarantee, whatever it might be, the mortgagee can simply sit there and sit on the, um, the property, it doesn't need to sell, doesn't need to move to sell. And um, that flows from cases. Uh, the key case, I suppose, is um, Tan and South Sea Bank. Tan and South Sea Bank in the Privy Council uh, back in the 1990s, uh, where Lord Wilberforce said that if you're a surety or you're a mortgage or you owe some money, 
uh, then you've simply got to bustle about. You can't, you can't complain about the mortgagee moving to sell or not sell at any particular time. You've got to bustle about, move around, pay out the debt, and then if you can refinance and simply come in and take over the security for yourself. In other words, there's no duty on the uh, mortgagee at any time to sell, which might be advantageous to you. And in Tan's case, Mr. George Tan, the famous uh, Hong Kong entrepreneur and billionaire, got a few scrapes up there uh, with Carry and Holdings. He alleged that South Sea Bank, I think down in Thailand, had held some shares of security. And uh, as a result of their failing to sell, the value of the security declined pretty calamitously. And as a result, he uh, had to pay back more. And the Privy Council said, well, the rule is that you must uh, move in yourself. If you're the guarantor mortgagor, you've got to pay out the security. You can't rely on the, on the uh, bank doing so at any particular time. That's got to be contrasted with a, with a, a position we'll discuss in a later video, which is the mortgagee's duties when selling. When the mortgagee moves to sell, then there are positive duties on the mortgagee to ensure that, they, uh, that he or she or it, usually the bank, obtains a good price, the best price. They can't fire sale, they can't sacrifice your interests. But that's entirely different from alleging that they're in a position where they have to sell or where they've got to sell at some opportune time for you. And uh, that's something that a lot of clients, lay clients, don't understand. They come to you and they say, well, if only the bank had sold up in January or February of last year or whatever, I would not now be facing this terrible loss. Uh, the fact is that they're not obliged to do that. Uh, they can simply sit and wait and sell uh, at the appropriate time as they wish. And we've got a number of cases that demonstrate that. I've already mentioned Tan's case. Tan case Tan's case makes that pretty clear. Uh, we've also got the case of Westpac Bank and Kingsland. There's an important case in New South Wales. And uh, Mailman's case as well is another important decision. So we've got basic decisions that say that, but you're not able to rely upon the bank uh, selling at a time favourable to you. Now, what about if you're in a position of negative equity? Well, let's hope that doesn't happen, but property market's bubbling up, of course. Prices are rising. People are borrowing on lower percentages in terms of deposit. And uh, financially, it may well be if the market drops 10 or 15%, then borrowers will find that they owe more on the property than the property is worth. Uh, is it possible in that situation to compel the bank to sell? Because, of course, the bank or lender will simply be in a position where they can hold on to the property and uh, can sit on it and uh, let the matter roll forward until such time as um, the market improves. All the time, of course, the actual uh, debt will be rising on the, on, the, uh, on the mortgage or the debt. Well, we've got a line of cases that suggest it's possible, um, which all really flow from a case in England, Polk's case, P-A-L-K, and we've got decisions in New South Wales. We've got New Beach Apartments and Epic Hotels, 2007, NSWSC at 474, um, which draws on an earlier decision, uh, one I was involved in, called Yarangar, Y-A-R-R-A-N-G-A-H, and National Australia Bank, 1999, NSWSC, 97, 9 Butterworth Property Reports, 17061. And... Um, those are cases looking at section 103 of the Conveyancing Act, which looks at the possibility of someone who has got a right to uh, enforce the mortgage or act on the mortgage being able to sell uh, sell up the mortgage if they wish to mortgage property. Uh, now, can the mortgage all rely on that? Well, there's a bit of a complexity. Section 103 of the Conveyancing Act is allegedly, uh, so section 103, six, I think says, not applicable to Torrance title land. But in uh, Yarangar's case, and also in New Beach, the judges have applied an analogous rule in equity, uh, which dates back to the old 1882 Property Law Act in England, which seems to permit you to come to court if you're in a position of negative equity, and other things being equal, um, get the court to sell and exercise a power of sale in court. Now that's one possible way of, of freezing a debt, because otherwise, of course, you're in a situation where there's the unauthorised loan rate, ULR, probably 2 or 3% more than the mortgage rate, the debt's compounding, the property is um, terribly in negative equity, and therefore you're in a difficult position. The debt's just rising, the bank sits on it. Well, we've already seen the bank doesn't seem to be under any particular duty to sell at any particular time. Tan's case stops you there, Tan in Kingsland. So what can you do? Well, one thing you might be able to do is go to court and uh, get an order for power of sale. And we've had a recent decision on that. Uh, Justice Lindsay has discussed the basic cases, although he didn't 
make an order in this case for various reasons in a case called uh, Kavousis, K-O-O-V-O-U-S-I-S uh, versus the trustee in bankruptcy of Rikik, the R-K-I-C, which is in 2014 NSWSC at 218, decision of early this year, 2014 NSWSC 218. And in that case, Jeff Lindsay looked at the situation uh, where a mortgagor was seeking uh, relief with a view to selling. He looks at the various cases and uh, he concludes on the facts of this particular case that he wasn't going to exercise any particular power, but he notes that it seems on the cases that such a power does exist. And uh, he discusses that at paragraph 20. Uh, his Honour says, um, the mortgagee accepts that in exceptional circumstances, the court has a discretionary jurisdiction in equity to make an order for a judicial sale of land over the objection of the mortgagee of land registered under the Real Property Act. And he refers to New Beach and Yarangar's case. And he says that jurisdiction is enlivened when conduct of a mortgagee in prospective enforcement of its rights under a mortgage would operate inequitably to the prejudice of the mortgagor. Well, that wasn't the case here. Uh, there was no question of inequity. But it's important to note that that residuary jurisdiction exists. And um, as I said, if the market dips and people suddenly find that the properties are worth 10 or 15% less than the, the full freight, the full price that's been paid in a fully priced market, uh, then that will be one possibility. And I suppose those number of applications will increase. All right, so to summarise so far, we're looking at a situation where the mortgagor uh, wants to prevent the mortgagee sale. Mortgagor uh, is not in any position to rely upon delay in terms of the sale. Mortgagor should have paid out the securities or the uh, interests and taken them over if it wishes to delay the sale. Um, that's not to say, of course, that there might be situations in which you can rely upon um, some uh, misleading or deceptive conduct, as we've said. It might be which you can rely upon something which attracts the court's auxiliary jurisdiction and uh, something under the you know, consumer law, uh, Australian consumer law, I suppose, the old section 52. We've got cases that suggest that is a possible argument. And uh, one case that suggests that is um, All Fox Building and Bank of Melbourne. So we've got cases which suggest it might be possible to rely upon some breach of a statute uh, or some failure to comply with the actual terms of the contract. And uh, an interesting case that looks at that particular aspect in some detail is Justice Slattery's decision in We Build Em, W-E-B-U-I-L-D-E-M, Propriety Limited and Lord, L-O-R-D, uh, 2013, NSWSC 1886, a decision at the very end of last year. And in that case, Justice uh, Slattery looked at a number of decisions involving getting an interlocutory injunction in terms of... Uh, uh, exercise of the power of sale and um, weighed the matter pretty carefully as, uh, as one would expect in terms of whether or not such relief should be granted and in that case he wasn't minded uh, to grant any relief um, I think because the debt was too large in the context of the of the debt which was being offered. So um, we've got a, a number of difficult issues to confront. You're rushing to court of course if you're in a position to actually refinance and pay out the debt and put it in a new lender uh, then the court will usually grant the discretion in your favour, exercise discretion in your favour. But if you're in a situation where you're trying to um, um, stave off the inevitable, as it were, then you'll be in more difficulty because you'll be facing a situation uh, where you're unable to pay in part or, it, or, or part or all of the mortgage debt and uh, the court will not usually look favourably upon a grant of relief. And so in that situation, um, the court will not normally injunct uh, not normally in junk for sale, the exercise of the sale.